wonder how many lives center around food, especially in America. You know, we're the land of abundance. There's a grocery store on every, every corner. In some of the third world nations and overseas, you go there and there's markets are few and far between. It's usually a guy with a cart and a couple of half dead vegetables trying to sell you something. But here in America, Oh man, it's piled up on everywhere. You got Publix and Winn-Dixie's and Safeways and Fresh Markets and Whole Foods and you know half foods and all kinds of foods. Anywhere you want to go, uh, we have a problem in this nation with obesity. I mean, it's incredible. It's not like America. Oh, half of America is starving to death. No, half of America is killing themselves because they're too darn big. They can't shut the yapper. I read an interesting story. You're going to say, Tom, you're making this up, but I'm not. Uh, this is a recent lawsuit. Um, Eric Edmonds was huge, tipping in almost 500 pounds. He went uh, to a hospital to lose weight, so he had a, a, a surgery, a stomach stapling. Uh, to, I guess they, they, they just make your stomach from this big to this big. So you won't eat as much. And hopefully the byproduct is you'll lose weight. 48 hours after the surgery, as he was recovering, uh, late in the evening, early morning, he got up out of his bed and he went down and found a hospital refrigerator. <laughs> and he began to eat everything he found in it, so much so that he actually burst a couple of his staples and which caused all kinds of problems inside and they had to go back in and redo the surgery and everything, it was a mess. Almost cost him his life because he couldn't stop eating. He sued the hospital and won a million dollars uh, or somewhere thereabouts because they were negligent in not keeping their refrigerators locked. <laughs> that's nuts, but that's honest goodness truth. I read it on World News. Um, a man goes to the hospital, 500 pounds, has an incredibly involved surgery called stomach stapling, and not 48 hours after the surgery as he's recovering, he's looking for a fridge. Folks, we got a problem in this country. The judge must have been his friend. Well, I don't know, maybe he ate him. But <laughs> The point is, we have a problem in this country. We eat, we eat, we eat, we're never satisfied, we just keep eating, keep eating. Well, you know, that's not a 20th century problem. People were hungry in the days of Christ, and they would eat and take anything they could get their hands on, even to the point where they, once Jesus fed them, they said, whoa, this is the guy we want as king. If he can do this with a little basket of, you know, bread and loaves or whatever, just think what he could do with other stuff. Jesus says, that's not why I came. And for the first time, Jesus usually goes toward the people to teach them. For the first time, he runs away. I don't want any part of this. Then he takes to himself the title, the bread of life. What does that mean? Especially in light of the term that he just fed the 5,000. Well, it means, I think, at least initially, it means that we need to refocus what we consider our priorities. The satiation of sensual pleasures on this earth is not all there is. You know, people, they go out to lunch, they have these wonderful lunches, they no sooner get done with it when they're already talking about, well, what are we going to do for dinner? <laughs> what? I've got to defrost something for dinner. I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Do you know why drive throughs became so popular in America? Any idea? Because we got to have it. I want a burger. I want it hot, fast, and now. And make it look like that picture. <laughs> I'm not allowed to eat Burger King Whoppers. I love Burger King Whoppers. I do. I'm not supposed to eat them. My cardiologist yells at me. Worse, the Lord yells at me. Even worse, my wife yells at me. After that Hurricane Irma, when everybody went down in power and everybody lost everything, I pulled up to Burger King, and they said, we have everything except Whoppers. <laughs> <laughs> All 
the burgers was, was spoiled. And I said, no, that's all right. I'll just go to the other Burger King out by my house. Oh, no, it's county-wide. No, none of them have burgers. We have a little chicken things. That's it. I had to look up to God and say, wow, really? The whole county? So Chandler can't get one burger? We're obsessed with it. And the fact of the matter is, regardless of what we eat and how much we eat, a day or so later, what's going to happen to us? We're going to be hungry again. And again, and again, and again. Jesus says you need to begin to refocus your priorities in life. You seek that which will satisfy you for an hour or a day. Maybe a weekend. But what I give you, the bread of life, what I give you will satisfy you all of your days. How, Lord? How will it satisfy me? Well, there's the answer. That's the question we got to answer. How will it satisfy me? There's an author named Jack Higgins. I don't know if you've ever read him. He wrote, um, uh, what did he write? I forget. Oh, The Eagle Has Landed. He wrote a the, uh, historical biography called The Eagle Has Landed. It's a great work. It's a great work. And he includes in his work some interviews that he had, like, kind of like a case study with different clients. And he was talking to some very successful people uh, who were, for whatever reason, depressed in their lives. And he kept interviewing them, kept interviewing. And he interviewed this one guy, and uh, I don't know who it is, uh, Michael Anderson. I don't know who he is, but evidently he's a zillionaire. And he spent his whole life climbing, clawing, scrapping for anything and everything. Wine, women, song, power, possession, the works. And he asked them, if you knew, if you could know anything as a child, what would you like to have known? You know what his answer is? I would like to have known as a child that when you get to the top, there's nothing there. Wow, sounds a little like Ecclesiastes, doesn't it? Wine without number, women without number, gold, power, possessions without number. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Anyway, if I could know one thing as a child, says this rich man who has, is totally, his life is meaningless, other than that junk he's accumulated, I would have liked to have known that once you claw and scrap and fight and claw your way up to the top, that when you get there, there's nothing there that will satisfy. You know, in the centuries before Christ, man used to fear death. Nobody could explain death. Everybody feared it. Since the coming of Christ, we feared guilt. You know, the concept that I'm a sinner and, wow, if I don't do something about my sin, I'm going to go to hell and all this stuff, right? And we feared death for centuries. It's what were the... Church grew so huge, pounding the pulpits and damning the pagans. We feared death before Christ. We didn't fear death after Christ, but we feared guilt after Christ. And then somewhere along the line, right after the Second World War, the little seeds of this thing that Bonhoeffer calls liberalism started. Where everything and anything's okay because you're worth it. And mankind no longer feared guilt. And mankind no longer had a conscience. And he went after anything and everything he wanted only to find no satisfaction there. If they're honest with themselves. Today, this culture, you know what it fears? Meaninglessness. A life without purpose, a life without value. 
just nothing matters. I can eat and eat and eat until I, the greatest and finest foods until I get sick and the next day it'll be gone. It won't mean a thing. Nothing is of value. The million dollar Maserati soon turns to rust. The big mansion is just starts falling apart. Even our own bodies. Let's face it, we ain't spring chickens. Fact of the matter is, it's like the Ecclesiasticus yells, vanity of vanities, all of life is but a vanity. Nothing that's ever going to be done hasn't already been done. Nothing new under the sun. Why try? Let me sit down and die. Really? See, modern generations, we fear lack of purpose, meaningless. When do I become important? Would this world truly be better off without me on board? Now, see, you got that backwards. The, the, the question is, would this world be better off if you weren't here? Well, the answer to that is no. God put you on this world for a purpose. I am the bread of life, said the Lord. Well, what does that mean? First of all, it means you got to start to refocus what you think is important on this planet. You are important on this planet. Not what you will possess, not what you will eat, not what you will gain. All of that stuff will end at the grave. The lawyers will fight over it. Your kids will get it anyway. What's important is you. You remember Andy Gibb back in the 70s? Anybody remember that name? He is the, the one guy in the history of solo artists that had, well, he had uh, 10 or 11 top 10 hits. But he was the one guy that had three hits, number one, number two, and number three the same week. The same week. Andy Gibb had it all going on, making millions of dollars. He had a little problem with some cocaine. <laughs> Because he was empty inside. And the little problem became a little bit bigger problem and a little bit bigger problem. And the psychologists are going crazy. We're going to escapism. What are we trying to escape? Ourselves. The meaninglessness in our lives. He had, uh, I want to be your everything and shadow dancing and all these songs playing on the radio 24-7. You couldn't turn the radio on without hearing Andy Gibb. Remember that high little voice? I want to be your everything. <laughs> Who sounds like that? Andy Gibb. Andy Gibb. <laughs> Went through rehab a number of times. Trying to find meaning and purpose. There's got to be something more. His brothers came in one day and found him. Coke on the table, him on the floor, and a life was gone. If you could know anything as a child, what would it be? I would have liked to have known that after I claw and scrap and scrape and kill to get on top, there's nothing there that's going to satisfy. Till Jesus showed up and said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will be satisfied forever. He who eats this bread and drinks this wine, we need to start rethinking what is important in our lives. We need to understand this generation is big and bold as they sound and talk and scrap and fight and curse and swear. They're, they're scared to death of being meaningless, living a life that amounts to nothing. I was in Walmart the other day. You ever been to Walmart lately? <laughs> wow. Talk about cultural experiences. I was in Walmart and there's a lady in front of me. Big lady, a little rough around the edges, I, I got a feeling. You know, wearing a man beater and kind of sweaty. I went, oh, there's a joy. And she had in her basket a boy about seven years old. And the kid, you know, was seven years old. He's trying to get something on the shelf. You know, kids are like that. They reach out and grab anything and everything that they think they want. And she slaps him and he 
cries a little bit, and he stops, and he starts reaching out again because he wants toys. Let's face it, he's seven years old. He says, Mommy, I want that, I want that. And she goes, you can't have it. And he said, why? And you know what her answer was? Because life sucks and then you die. <laughs> I kid you not. I took two steps back because she was bigger than me. And I didn't want to die because life sucks and then you die. Can you imagine being a seven-year-old child and being exposed to that? I know it's a joke. We laugh about it as adults. He was seven years old. He was doing what seven-year-olds do. He was acting his age. Mom was not. Life sucks and then you die. What a horrible principle to teach a child. Horrible principle. And we are one of the unhappiest nations on the planet, even though we've got bread and food and supermarkets on every corner. And for those who don't find that enough, oh, we've got a bar on every corner too. We've got designer drugs, not just regular drugs. Hmm. Designer drugs. So you can kill yourself in a chic kind of way. What would you have liked to have known if you could be a child? Well, I like to have known that I spend my entire life scrapping and scraping up the hill. Jesus made another reference to that in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, you know, you cling and you claw and you climb to the top of, he calls it the dung heap. And when you get there, what do you have? Well, you've got the best view of the dung heap. But realize what you're standing on. <coughs> wow. I am the bread of life, said the Lord. I think he meant that we need to begin to focus on what's truly a priority or should be. If we're looking for things to satisfy, how about inviting the spirit, the presence of the almighty God that puts you on this planet, by the way, for a purpose. And without him, you will never find that purpose. You will continue to cling and to claw and to fight your way to the top. Only to find out that when you get there, it's not enough. Sadly, many people don't realize that till they're on their deathbed. And they cry out like many have over the ages, is there nothing more? There's always been more. There's always been more. It is Jesus Christ, the Lord. And he takes to himself the bread of life. Think about bread for a minute, if you will. Just that image. To get, how do you get bread? Wheat. Got to grow the wheat. Then you take the wheat. What do you got to do with the wheat? Grind it up. You get in the flour. After the flour, what do you got to do? No, you got to shove it in the oven. <laughs> Run it through the heat. You might eat it raw. Well, he's an idiot. <laughs> no, you got to run it through the oven. And you look at Jesus' life. What did he do? Well, he started to grow up. He had to grow up and bring the message of God to a people that are hmm, most ungodly. And then they took him and... Regardless of all the things he did well, they, they took him and they ground him up. And they tore him up. Must be done with this once and for all. And we're told, of course, to the creeds that, and, and, and the book of Isaiah that this Messiah, once he was ground up, he entered the, the, the gates of Hades and set there the captive souls free. They put him through the oven. And he tells us that he is the bread of life. His whole life was like a loaf of bread. Grown for a specific reason. Put under the hardness and the grindness of the wheel. And thrown into the fire. 
Wow. The last thing he said before going to the crucifixion was, this is my body, which is broken for you, all of you. Take it, eat it. Lord, that's just weird. I am the bread of life. It's necessary. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Take it. Drink it, all of you. It's necessary for your sakes. I'm not sure the guys understood it that night. Glorious event, but I'm not sure they were any wiser than we are. But after his resurrection, he said, See, I told you. Put your hand here and see my wounds. Put your hand here. Now let me tell you again that this bread of life will not just satisfy you now. The kingdom of God is at hand. But will satisfy you into the glories forever. I don't think those guys understood it on the night of the Last Supper, but they came to understand it. And they refocused their priorities. And do you know that every single one of them went to their death preaching and teaching about the bread of life. And Winchester asked that boy as he died and breathed his last, what do you, what is happening? Some writer somewhere was put that profundity in there. I smell bread. Wow. Father, I thank you for this morning. And I ask that you help each of us set our priorities, that we do in fact enjoy the bread of life. For it is in the breaking of bread and of the drinking of wine that we come to know that life, not just here, but forever. So bless each one here, Holy Father, and let them know that when they partake of the sacraments, when they in, ingest your word, it is no small thing they are doing. For you are writing their names even now in the very book of life. And that life is forever. Would the planet be better if we were not here? No, it would not. Is the planet richer when we find our Lord, profess his name, and enjoy the beauty of his world? Yes, it is. Let each of us take always the bread of life. In his glory we pray and we thank you. Amen.